Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, and welcome to the interaction design session of IEEE VR 2022. Uh, I'm Rick Scarbez, and I'll be your session chair uh, for today. And just a quick bit of housekeeping before we jump into the talk so that we can have enough time for everybody to give their presentations and get some good questions. The place to ask questions is in the Discord server. So if you jump over to the Discord, there is a channel for this session for the interaction design session. Uh, and please put any questions for the speakers that you have there. Uh, the way this session is going to work is we're going to deliver the five talks that we have back to back. And then we'll have hopefully a good chunk of time at the end of the session to handle questions uh, and have some discussion. And uh, in that case, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Danielle Loach, who is presenting Exploring and Selecting Super Shapes in Virtual Reality with Line, Quad, and Cube Shaped Widgets. Please take it away. Okay, thanks, Rick. Um... Let me share my screen. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, I'm Daniel Lop, and I will be presenting our work on VR shaped widgets. Um, this is a joint work between the University of Lisbon, uh, University of Antwerp, KO Leuven, and Ines TV at Lisbon. So, um, super shapes are a, a class of shapes uh, using parametric design uh, to model literally thousands of natural and man-made shape um, shaped objects with only six uh, six parameters so the formula that we are using only has six parameters as shown here in this equation on the bottom so uh, these these 2d super shapes are considered as a generalization of circles super ellipses um, and even polygons um, and the parameters of the super shape formula uh, encode uh, geometric features such as shape, dimension, curvature, and symmetry. Um, and they can be used to model different different objects. So um, these shapes were originally formulated by Hewan Helis uh, from Antwerp uh, to model objects found in nature, such as flowers, leaves, shells, eggs, and they have been successfully tested on more than 40,000 species, species found in, in biology. Um, they have also been used in parametric design to model uh, man-shaped objects uh, in CAD systems and even in procedural modeling in VR. The issue is that interacting with super shapes is, uh, is quite challenging. Uh, first of all, um, users are left to probe a rich and very dense collection of shapes uh, using just a set of independent 1D sliders. And uh, the second challenge is that the, the exponent parameters of the formula are nonlinear in nature, which makes them particularly difficult to grasp uh, using conventional 1D sliders alone. There are um, several VR apps that explore the benefits of VR in parametric design, although none of them or none of these solutions use super shapes as a modeling primitive. Um, however, VR can surely become an appropriate parametric design medium for modeling objects that are made with these super shapes, especially if we think them as um, cross sections to model 3D objects. So in our work, we focus on which type of VR widget uh, best suits uh, fundamental super shape modeling tasks, so shape exploration and shape, shape selection. And to cope with the, the challenges of interacting with super shapes, uh, we propose the design of uh, line, quad, and cube shape widgets for probing the 1D, 2D, and 3D uh, exponent, exponent parameter spaces. Um, our, our, our designs consider techniques that are found in slider design and InfoV studies. And even though uh, most of these techniques were not designed specifically for VR in mind, uh, they are easily expandable or extendable to spatial user interfaces. In terms of methodology, our VR shape widgets were developed in Unity and coded in um, with the XR interaction toolkit and also C sharp uh, scripting. And the VR app runs on Oculus Quest. Uh, we considered these three major types of uh, shapes, so the line, quad, and cube shape widgets for probing uh, 1D, 2D, and 3D exponent uh, parameter spaces. 
these are the parameters, uh, the major parameters of the of the formula. And um, we had to uh, fit the, the the we had to to do specific types of designs for this for this for these widgets so so that to, they can cope with the, the, these parameters. So the first thing we need to do was, was to um, to fit the, the exponent values that range from uh, nearly zero to plus infinity. Um, so we need to fit all those values into a, a finite uh, interval. So to be to be more specific, we, we needed to fit them into into the a shorter interval to be to, to, to catch all the the most representative shapes. Okay, so we need to rescale the the intervals to equally size sub intervals, um, and also uh, which really helped the the design or the interaction with these with, with these widgets with the introduction of thumbnails or small multiples if we wish um, where we render dozens of super shapes in real time and, and instead of using multiple triangles per shape um, we can we coded a, a, a fragment shader a hlsl fragment shader that only needs two triangles per shape so that allowed us high performance rate to render dozens of super shapes in real time on a standalone headset um, we also considered uh, uh, something similar to worlds in miniature, um, which we called minimaps and resizable handles uh, that work as lenses, uh, since they display regular spaced samples of the super shapes and the venicity of the handle position. And here's a short video of our prototype in action. So we can see for the 1D case, uh, there's a slider, the handle, which is uh, with the size of the, the handles is resizable. We also see some thumbnails in um, the mini maps that, that will, will aim to assist the, the selection process. In this case, the 2D one, this is a 3D uh, shape widget that has much more exponent values to explore and allows uh, a, a, a larger catalog of shapes to be, to be selected. We then conducted um, a user study to compare the VR shape widgets among each other and also against conventional 1D sliders. Uh, and a total of nine widgets were considered, okay? Um, in terms of metrics, uh, we compared the widgets in terms of selection, uh, if, if efficiency, accuracy, perceived usability, and task load, but also, uh, we also measured participant satisfaction and participant participant preference. Um, even during these uh, troublesome times, uh, we managed to recruit a total of eighteen participants, eight of which had VR experience, but none of the participants knew what a super shape. We performed a within subject evaluation, and each participant performed a total of twenty seven tasks, testing all nine widgets. And in terms of result, re results, um, firstly, uh, about efficiency. In general, the VR shape widgets present uh, shorter times compared to conventional 1D sliders. Uh, however, surprisingly, the task completion time for 3D shape widgets did not benefit from mini maps or the, those worlds in miniature. And when it comes to selection accuracy, uh, in general, VR shape widgets were more accurate than conventional sliders. Although no statistical significance was measured for 3D shape widgets, um, unexpectedly, uh, mini maps did not have a significant effect and in, uh, in selection accuracy for, for all shape widgets with mini maps. As for uh, perceived task load, um, no sig significant effect was observed uh, between the conventional sliders, the shape widgets, and the shape widgets with mini maps. And um, finally, our results revealed that the VR shape widgets without mini maps were the most well scored in terms of perceived usability, user satisfaction, and also preference. And um, to summarize, uh, we found that the VR shape widgets were effective, more efficient, and natural than conventional uh, VR 1D sliders while also usable for users without prior knowledge on super shapes, which is quite interesting. Um, and we also found that the proposed VR widgets uh, provide a quick overview of the main super shapes uh, within, uh, within those intervals, the three, three dimensional intervals of the exponent parameters and users can, can easily reach the desired solution without having to perform uh, fine grain handle manipulations. So that's about it for seven minutes. 
Thanks. Thank you very much, Daniel. I think that was uh, an excellent presentation and some really interesting work. Uh, much appreciated. So uh, with that, we will keep moving, keep this moving at a brisk pace. So just to get our next presenter a few seconds to get ready. Uh, the second paper in today's session is the potential of augmented reality for digital twins, a literature review presented by Andreas Kuntz. Uh, Andreas, take it away. So now it should work. I was somehow muted. Okay, now to something completely different. Yeah, so hi and welcome. I'm Andreas and uh, I'm pleased to share some of the results of our literature review uh, with you. Uh, it might not perfectly fit uh, this session with interaction design. It's more a global overview on AR in general, uh, where it's used for, and of course also uh, in conjunction with um, more uh, industrial type applications. Um, so the potential of augmented reality for digital twins. And we did a literature review using these um, keywords. So we've searched for mixed reality uh, and augmented reality and also the abbreviations of them. And uh, in conjunction with digital twin or virtual twin. So uh, our review is uh, based on the Prisma process. And after our initial search, uh, in those um, databases that you can see here, ACM, uh, IEEE, Springerlink, and Science Direct, uh, we had over a thousand results. And in the end, however, and luckily, uh, most of them were not really relevant um, at all or in, in part. So in the end, we reviewed 42 full text articles and book chapters. And finally, 25 papers actually made it into our final review. And the other papers, so they either didn't cover augmented reality and digital twin in combination uh, or failed to fulfill uh, other criteria that we have um, defined up front and that can be seen in the in schematics here on the right hand side. So uh, first of all, we decided to um, have a look at the definitions because of course it's very uh, interesting whether to include or exclude something. Um, based on the definitions, whether we can just uh, go back on the standard definitions by <clears throat> the dinosaurs of, of AR and digital twin, or um, if we can um, come up with, with some other um, new, new definition or at least uh, some properties for, for these words. Um, so it turned out that uh, several papers used the terms pretty differently in different ways. And therefore, it seemed uh, the more important to declare the main properties of, of each term. And as you can see here, for the term digital twin, most of the reviewed papers defined uh, digital twin as a virtual representation of real world assets um, with the goal to show information of the current state of that asset. And that might have been a real production line in as far as, as industry uh, applications are concerned or actually any other asset, any, any machine, could be actually anything. And as far as augmented reality was concerned, we figured out that even there uh, still are some differences as far as um, the term and definition is concerned. So more than half of the papers did describe AR as, of course, just computer generated information uh, and mostly even um, 3D, three-dimensional objects. Uh, being superimposed in real time and uh, in an interactive manner. And so all the papers that did not fulfill these properties were then in the end also actually excluded. <clears throat> so 
we did a thorough analysis of all the 25 papers in several different aspects. And of course, I can't uh, cover them here in, in, in this presentation. I just want to focus on one interesting aspect, in my opinion, and that's uh, the categorization by research topics. So what did those papers want to achieve and what uh, did they want to answer? What kind of research um, questions? Uh, it got a bit difficult as uh, the borders between uh, our topics that we have defined were quite fuzzy. Um, and so uh, I've tried to create a, a concept map that uh, puts all the different keywords being mentioned by the different papers uh, into relation. So I just go through that uh, concept map. So let's start with the information uh, visualization uh, topic. And that one includes the general instructions information about the system state and also uh, three-dimensional representations of the digital twin. And the 3D models form the basis for virtual prototyping, whereas the system state uh, was used for diagnostics uh, and monitoring. And the monitoring capabilities um, fostered and improved uh, maintenance processes, error prevention, uh, and also adjustments uh, of the system. So whenever uh, one of these keywords was mentioned in a paper, we've put it in, into that uh, information visualization uh, category. And uh, now on the left-hand side, we introduce our next category called guidance, included um, guiding, uh, guided assembly and also training scenarios. And of course, you can see there are some overlaps between the different categories already. And on the right hand side, um, we should see, hopefully, it's paused here. Yeah, so we see the um, digital twin control. Uh, so we subsumed all works mentioning those virtual dashboards and the adjustments and, and configuration uh, into that category. And the different arrows should again show the um, connections between those different three categories. And whenever a paper mentioned one of um, those terms where several arrows meet, then we've also put it into multiple categories, actually. So let's have a look at the distribution of these research uh, topics that uh, can be seen here in this graph. So uh, in the end, information visualization was covered by most of them because um, as we've seen also before, it might be also the, the base for, for other categories. And the other two categories, so guidance and digital twin controls were um, mentioned or, or um, used by less than, than half of the papers. Um, and of course, what's very interesting is also the, the domains. So as far as the domains are concerned, the main area um, um, was by far manufacturing. Um, of course, with uh, these um, search terms that we've used, it's, it's already uh, going to the industry uh, part there. However, uh, it was still some interesting uh, domains that we found. So education, uh, especially also gastronomy, facility management, and urban planning. So there were at least one paper, somewhere also two or three that were dealing with these uh, topics. As far as the results in general are concerned of uh, all the papers, um, the major finding actually was that most of the papers really just described their applications or concepts without any detailed testing. And only six out of uh, all the 25 uh, actually uh, evaluated their implementation in a, in a more thoughtful way. And three had some sort of um, user feedback uh, integrated. And then there were several uh, papers that just declared that their work um, led to an improved information visualization of an existing um, application, for example, or it led to an improved workflow or a um, digital twin control itself. So what can we take away from our literature review? So in the end, so first, um, it was interesting, there are still no real common definitions of, of those terms. 
Um, digital twin, it's also something that is that was mentioned uh, decades ago and augmented reality, of course, too. Um, and it showed that those terms are still used uh, a little bit differently, at least. And um, second, the majority of the reviewed papers really uh, focus on industrial applications. Again, maybe if we changed, um, had changed um, the keywords a little bit, it might be different, but in this case, it was very industry driven. However, some addressed uh, interesting domains, as I mentioned before, the gastronomy, especially in facility management or uh, education. Um, the main problems all the authors uh, stated um, was actually setting up um, the connection between augmented reality application and the digital twin. And fourth, last but not least, um, so all papers are very technically focused. Um, and what yeah we figured out, so they mostly neglected proper evaluation, uh, especially of usability and experience. And that was uh, also interesting, especially in, in, in um, regarding industry 4.0, um, that still there, it's very technically driven, although the human factor is um, mentioned as one important aspect uh, of industry 4.0. So uh, that was most of the time neglected. So thank you very much for your attention and um, I'm there for questions uh, at the end, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andreas, for, for an interesting presentation. And I'm, I'm sure if, if no one else has questions, I will have questions for you later. I think you are actually well suited for this session, not in the sense that you are evaluating interaction design, but I think this is a very interesting use case for interaction design. So, you know, if you have thoughts about that, you can start preparing them now. Uh, hello and welcome to anybody who may have joined after the start of the session. And just one more reminder that if you have questions for the authors, please go put them in the Discord channel. Uh, but without any further ado, we'll move on to our third paper in this session, which is the effect of exploration mode in frame of reference in immersive analytics presented by George Wagner. George, it's all yours. Hi, Rick. Thank you so much for the introduction. So I, I hope you are now seeing my slides and everything is correct. So uh, I'm very happy to be here at VR this year, even if just virtually to present our TVCG paper published last year called The Fact of Exploration Mode and Frame of Reference in Immersive Analytics. So uh, Immersive analytics, uh, which Ex often corresponds me, George, to the application I, I, don't, of... I don't mean to interrupt, but uh, we're seeing the uh, black squares where your notes are uh, obscuring your slides. My apologies. Uh, of course, I will mm, resize this. What about now? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Maybe I, uh, I think now the, the camera view moved away. So, okay, so is this right? Thank you. So uh, as I was saying, uh, this was a, a TVCG paper published last year called the effect of exploration mode and frame of reference in immersive analytics. Immersive analytics, which often corresponds to the application of VR or AR user interfaces to data visualization, is, in my opinion, a, a quickly growing topic in recent editions of this conference. Immersive analytics is, uh, offers us approaches that allow us to leverage the unlimited display space around us and treat the user interfaces to better interact with 2D or even uh, or especially 3D information. And this follows what we envisioned, for example, in those uh, classical sci-fi movies. You will probably also remember that immersive analytics was the topic of that great keynote uh, yesterday by Professor Tim Dwyer. The motivation that for the specific study that I want to present to you today is that in order to better understand the potential contributions of VR for data exploration, first, we should better understand the available design space. So immersive analytics can support a vast set of potential metaphors ranging from exocentric data perspectives to large scale egocentric data perspectives. Some, interest, some interesting studies in recent years have already began to explore the effects of different metaphors. 
but we believe a larger experiment would be more adequate to better isolate the effects of the relevant variables in play here. For this reason, in this study I'm going to present today, we have defined three representative frames of reference. In exocentric uh, room scale view, which you can see on the left of the screen, the user has full data overview, seeing that data positioned over a virtual desk. In the egocentric room scale, which you can see in the center, the user can explore details and also use, for example, the sense of proprioception for estimations and comparisons while uh, walking inside the data. And while these first two modes, uh, the, the data fits inside a room scale environment and the user can walk, on the right, you, you, we also have the egocentric large scale mode where uh, the user is unconstrained by the physical space and can explore all parts of the data in a much larger virtual environment. And uh, besides these three frames of reference, we have also defined three representative exploration modes. This is because in immersive analytics environments, users can move the data, for example, by using hand controllers or uh, hand tracking, but they can also move themselves inside that data, either by walking, as I mentioned before, or also uh, flying in 3D space uh, using a flying platform. And of course, they can also use combinations of these two forms of interaction. By combining these two main design variables, the frame of reference and the exploration modes, we, you, we obtain these nine different conditions that you can see in, on, the, on this table. And here you can also see the, the three different prototype environments that we implemented to uh, reproduce these interaction modes and frames of reference. So in the EXO prototype, the user walks around the, the, the data, which is positioned over this virtual desk. In EGO, the user is inside the room scale room and uh, can walk inside the data. And finally, in HUGE, uh, the user can fly inside the data using a flying platform. And these field of view restrictions you are seeing uh, help us to reduce simulator sickness. All of these prototypes implement a space-time cube visualization. Uh, so this is uh, a case study, uh, use case that we already used in uh, previous evaluations for immersive analytics. And even uh, some papers that we saw yesterday also follow the same visualization. Uh, just to recap, the space-time cube is a visualization that allows us to see movement trajectories uh, across space on the horizontal plane and also uh, time on the vertical dimension and so leveraging the three spatial dimensions to inspect this different uh, these complementary uh, categories of the spatial temporal data but given this large number of conditions that i showed you before we decided to adopt a, a mixed experimental design for this study so uh, the three uh, environments, they become a between subjects factor and the three exploration modes become a within subjects factor. And in total, we recruited 36 participants for this study. Each of the participants performed a series of spatial temporal information seeking or interaction tasks in all the three exploration modes using the same frame of reference. So uh, let's see what we found out in this user study. Our findings suggest that different approaches result in different benefits. So on one hand, the egocentric room scale exploration mode significantly reduced the user mental workload uh, as measured by the NASA TLX questionnaire. And you can see this uh, on this plot here where the ego modes are shown in blue and uh, it's a very noticeable difference. But on the other hand, the exocentric exploration also had an advantage in another sense. They improved performance in the information seeking tasks, which in this study were represented by task one, where the exo modes are marked in green, as you can see on the highlighted part. So uh, in this case, exocentric exploration led to higher success rates and shorter completion times. In this uh, task, the participants uh, had to locate uh, the spatial position of one of the trajectories at a specific date and time, and apparently having sorry, apparently having an exocentric overview of the data prevented mistakes in this situation. 
But moving on to the effects of the exploration modes now, we also observed that combining navigation and manipulation consistently lowered the uh, NASA TLX workload and several of its subcomponents. We also saw that combining navigation and manipulation led to significantly higher reported task keys for three out of four tasks. And uh, meanwhile, using only manipulation, which I mark here by M, led to worse performance in two tasks. So a series of indicators that uh, combinations of manipulation and navigation uh, can have benefits in data exploration. In this study, we also reproduced an analysis previously done by uh, Lages and Bowman in a prior work, which investigated the effect of individual factors such as spatial ability and gaming frequency. We noticed here that uh, these factors correlate in different ways to performance and preferences in data exploration. So for example, participants more used to gaming to class time in huge when using manipulation and navigated more in huge when used the combined forms. And also uh, very noticeably, the different frames of reference resulted in opposite effects in this sense. So we discussed this in greater length in our paper. Now, in terms of the simulator sequence scores, which are all, always a concern in, in immersive applications like this, we observe that all frames of reference here uh, led to uh, comfortable scores. They were considered comfortable. We believe this was likely due to our implementation choices that I showed you before, such as providing that field of view reduction and also a magic carpet platform when the user is flying around. And finally, our study also suggests that navigation can increase the sense of being there in that virtual environment compared to using only uh, manipulation. And this was regardless of the frame of reference, as you can see uh, on this plot. So uh, let's recap. The main takeaways from this study indicate that egocentric room with scale exploration uh, might reduce mental workload while exocentric room scale exploration might improve performance in some information seeking tasks. So they have complementary benefits. And in terms of exploration modes, we recommend that uh, co always combine navigation and manipulation when possible, since this also leads to advantages. But since this study that I presented to you today in our view, provides a series of interesting insights on the difference between different frames of reference and exploration modes. Of course, there are still many uh, research directions to be explored in future work. So this will include investigating variables that we kept fixed in this study, such as alternative uh, visual representations beyond the space-time cube, other interaction metaphors, other environment sizes uh, or different room sizes, for example, or different scales for the, re the huge environments and also different usage modes. For example, when you are standing instead of walking like I showed in this study. So uh, for a more complete discussion and additional findings, please don't hesitate to check the full publication which is available in my webpage. And of course, uh, share your questions on this card uh, so I can comment on them in the end of the session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, George, for your presentation. Very interesting stuff uh, and, and well presented. So uh, in the interest of keeping things moving, uh, our next speaker is unfortunately unable to be here in person, but we are going to have her video, uh, which is synthesizing personalized construction safety training scenarios for VR training presented by Wan Wan Lee. Sorry, Alex, we don't have sound. We only have the captions. Hello, everyone. I'm going to present the paper in the Center of Coastal Life and Graphic Safety Training Scenarios for VR training. As we all know, construction safety training is very important, especially it's important for the workers' life. 
And in the real case, there are lots of tragedies that is uh, caused by the lack of, of the efficient uh, construction safety training. So here we propose a novel approach to approve the personalized uh, training scenarios for the construction safety training. In our case, we pre-evaluate the user's performance in their understanding of construction safety. And then according to their performance, we synthesize the personalized training scenarios of, uh, automatically using the optimization approach. Basically, we give them any input of a construction scene. We optimize the route also along with the hazards on the scene to help the users understanding the uh, construction safety knowledge. And then we train them in this uh, virtual reality platform. That is uh, uh, with this synthesized uh, training scenarios. After we train them in the virtual reality, we post-evaluate their performance. So here is the input of a construction scene. And then we animate, we, we analyze the anim, uh, the anim, uh, we analyze the navigation mesh of this thing. Where the blue regions are the area which is workable and the other regions is not workable. Then we, we randomly set some vertices in this thing. They are labeled by the work, work sign. And then we generate the navigation path between every two vertices, and we construct a regular graph on this navigation graph. And then we can navigate the users between different vertices in the scene. Our goal is to cover this scene using these vertices. Therefore, the, the user is able to navigate every while in this team. At the same time, we analyze the hazard in the scene and label the hazards with different colors. We have four common hazards, including the struck by hazard. Really, the hazard is moving and construct the users to cause difficulty. Another is fall hazard, where the, where the region is easy for the user to fall, therefore cause the, cause the fall hazard. Another one is called a caught-in hazard. Caught-in is also called caught-in caught between hazard. Where the hazards coming from two sides and crush, crush the user in between. Another one is called electrical, electrical hazard, where the region can cause any electrocution on the users. Then we are trying to minimize the total cost or optimize or personalize the treatment scenarios. With the cost of functions in general, we have the overall cost of function here. And then we have the dynamic hazard. Dynamic hazard cost is caused by the mo motion of the hazard. Therefore, we're using a probability functions and how likely who it is that a particular region uh, is, has that hazard. So basically, in this case, uh, when the trunk enter into this uh, enter into this uh, red circle, and then there will be some hazard happen there. And we just calculate how how much time uh, this car will enter into this region, and this is the probability that the hazard can happen in this red region. Another one is called. The static hazard. Static hazard basically is a hazard that is not moving. And in this case, that hazard can be an electrification hazard, fall hazard, or caught in between hazard. And here we say this static hazard is an electrocution hazard. Basically, every time when the user 
enter into this region, which means it's very dangerous. So then the hazards might, ha might happen. And then we calculate how long, how, how much, how long of this route that is entering such kind of hazard. And then we do a, a linear integrations on this route. We can calculate the frequency that the user is close enough to a particular type of hazard. Then by setting the, the frequency for each type of hazard, then we can achieve the personalized goal. For example, we can adjust the lambda to adjust the, the hazard frequency for, for each type of hazard. And here is the time is the training time cost. The training time cost basically has two parts. The first part is how long does this take for the user to navigate along the paths, and another part is the time that is used for the user to identify each type of hazard. And we call that T, THI is evaluated and estimated by a preliminary study. And here is the organizations, you know, the organization process. We modify the training scenarios by adding a vortex, removing a vortex, or modify a vortex, or adding a hazard, remove a hazard, or modify a hazard. And then we evaluate the, the total cost of functions. Then we're using the uh, simulated linear approach to, to decide whether a new move can be accepted using this Boltzmann like function, you know, F R H. You R is a root, H is a hazard in this state. Then we optimize the hazards according to different scenarios. First one, well, it's more four hazard. Second one, well, they are more coffee hazard. Third one, they are more electric fusion hazard. This is the result that is synthesized with different personalized settings. The first one is the scene synthesized with the root with fewer hazards. The second scene is synthesized with the root with more four hazards. The third training scenario is synthesized with the root with more coating between hazards. The fourth is synthesized with the root with more electrical hazards. And the, the, the fifth figure it's the synthesized training scenario with small struck by height. And the last figure shows the synthesized result with all type of height. Now it's the user study. We have divided the user into three groups and uh, to do the control comparison between different groups. The first group is called the last group. We basically train the users using the slides, which is a traditional way to train the uh, construction safety knowledge. Another one is called free exploration VR group. We are using a traditional VR settings that user can explore the scene uh, freely and there's no any guidance. The last group is called the Personalized Guidance VR Group. This group is trained using the VR training scenarios. This is said using our personalized organization approach that we evaluate the user's performance and then we get a score. According to the score, we generalize the personalized scenes and then the user can be trained in this VR scene. Let's show the result. Here are the user's improvements with respect to three different conditions. The blue one is the improvement from the slice group. Second one is from floor exploration VR group. The third one is from the personalized guidance VR group. As we can see, there is a significant improvement that the user behaves much better in the personalized guidance group, then the free exploration VR group and the slide group 
but also we can see there is difference between the flow inspiration of MIA group and slides group. That means we are we are training is better than the traditional training, but the personalized VR training is much, much better than the traditional VR training. So this is the end of our video. Thanks for watching. All right. Thank you for that. And we are on to our last, but certainly not least paper of the session. And then we will have some discussion. Uh, our last paper is POVR point authoring presentations in mobile vir virtual reality presented by Verena Biener. Uh, Verena, you can take it away. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I'm Marina. I present you our paper for VR point authoring presentations in mobile virtual reality. So slide based presentation tools are widespread across many sectors, such as education, business or academia. And in recent years, people work more and more in less optimal environments, for example, at home or in makeshift offices or even on the go. So to be productive in such small spaces, we focus on small portable devices like tablets. However, it can be uncomfortable and exhausting to work on such small devices. So VR has the potential to support mobile knowledge workers by complementing traditional input devices with a large three-dimensional output space and spatial input. So VR can increase the privacy and reduce environmental clutter. And the paper, probes the VR design space for authoring presentations in such mobile settings. And therefore we propose a set of tools for common tasks when authoring presentations. And common interaction techniques for VR like in-air interactions with controllers or hands, they might not be well suited for limited spaces in mobile settings, especially regarding practicality or social acceptability or also fatigue. So we use mobile devices like tablets and augment the touch-based interaction with eye-tracking and bimanual pen and touch techniques with a spatially tracked pen. So previous work has already looked at pen-based, in-air and gaze-based interaction. For example, myself, we have looked at a combination of eye-gaze and touch to interact with multiple displays. Feuffer et al. have looked at uh, combined, combined gaze and in-air pinch gestures. And there's also been previous work on presenting in XR. For example, Cochrane et al. used a 3D projection system to enhance anatomy lectures and found it effective and more enjoyable than 2D presentations. And McIntyre et al. found that social virtual environments offer a reasonable experience for attending conferences remotely. So we looked at several challenging aspects of using a 2D slide editing program, like dealing with 3D orientations, ordering of stacked objects, dealing with temporal data, and also retrieving information from a large corpus of graphical data. Um, we then designed a set of interaction and visualization techniques which use the advantages that VR provides, like the large display space, the depth display, and inner interactions. And our techniques are just sample points in the entire space of tasks uh, that can be used for presentation authoring, but they can already show the advantages of using VR. As you can see in the image, we use the tablet in front of the user and the pen, and both tablet and the pen were tracked and visualized in VR. So our four techniques are the object manipulation technique, um, which allows the user to manipulate objects in 3D using the spatially tracked pen. The animation technique, which allows the user to create and edit animations while the time is represented in the third dimension above the tablet. Then the occlusion handling technique, which displays several layers of an object on a slide slightly separated using the three-dimensional visualization. And working across slide, uh, which uses the large output space to display more information 
that can be assessed using eye tracking and touch. And we did a usability evaluation of all these techniques and found that they were enjoyable, easy to use and useful. Then we also wanted to quantify the benefit of the large field of view in VR compared to tablet screens. Uh, so we conducted the SEF study where we had an image shown to the participants and then they needed to find this image among a set of other images. And we found that the larger field of view makes the visual search faster if the target is easy to identify, but not if it takes more mental effort to identify the target. Um, yeah, more detail on that you can find in the paper. Uh, in a second study, we evaluated our occlusion handling technique by comparing it to existing versions of PowerPoint. So in the normal PowerPoint, <clears throat> you can click a button or move an object in a list to bring it to the foreground, to the background. Then there's also a 3D reordering technique in PowerPoint for Mac, which provides this 3D view of layers on the 2D screen where you can then drag and drop the different layers. And in our VR technique, the object's layers are standing on top of the tablet screen, slightly separated, and they can then also be moved back and forth. And in the study, the task was to bring the object with the red circle or the layer with the red circle directly in front of the layer with the yellow square. And by that, we measured task completion time, simulator sickness, usability, and task load. And we had 14 participants in the study. Regarding the task completion time, we found that the VR method was significantly faster than both other methods. Also, the usability of the VR method was significantly higher than both other methods. The task load was significantly lower or we are compared to this 3D method, but not compared to the standard PowerPoint. Also, all but one participant preferred the VR method. They said it gave them the fastest overview. And if something was occluded, they could move their heads to better see which layer belongs to which object. And the interaction was just more convenient. And in contrast, in the 3D technique, we saw that participants often touched the wrong layer when they wanted to select an object. And such a technique could, of course, also be used in other applications, like, for example, image editing. So in conclusion, we presented the Power VR point, a set of presentation authoring tools. We found that a wider field of view can result in significantly faster target identification times. Also, we saw that the three-dimensional theory in VR outperformed two baseline techniques for reordering layered objects, and our interaction techniques were found to be usable and enjoyable. And in the future, we would like to explore knowledge truck experiences with multiple applications at use at any time, which would also include transferring content across many applications. And we would also like to support collaborative work. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Verena, and thank you to all of our speakers for uh, excellent presentations today. With that said, let's jump into the discussion section. There are some specific questions coming in on the Discord, uh, in particular for Daniel and for George. Uh, and maybe for Verena, but they uh, might need a bit more time to make that decision. Uh, but I'm going to pull rank a little bit and decide to uh, the first question, at least for each of you to give you all a chance to speak is just going to be to expand a little bit on the the what are your next steps, right? Not possibly future work, but not even necessarily future work, maybe something a little bit more speculative. You know, what is the, the future of the research begun in the paper that we've seen today? Uh, and we'll just go in panelist order. So let's start with Daniel. Uh, sorry to put you on the spot, but there you go. Thanks. Um, so as future work, we, we're considering um, to develop a, a more, uh, a, a kind of a gravity sketch application with the with the widget. So that was the initial idea. That was the initial ambition, was to was to develop um, 
a 3D modeling VR uh, application. But then we realized that the widgets, uh, well, they cared for a bit more attention uh, in terms of design. So we could just try to use sliders, but then we figured out, okay, this is not as good uh, to do with the sliders alone. So let's try something else. Uh, let's try to redesign the, the, the widgets and um, make them tailored specific, so to speak, uh, for super shape selection and, and exploration. So, but the next step is to, yeah, so to, to either develop a new, not a new, but not, probably not a new one, but uh, uh, some sort of module that can be implemented in Gravity Sketch or one of, one of those VR modeling uh, apps. Awesome. Thank you. Great answer. I'm, I'm looking forward to the ability to use uh, super shapes in my uh, future VR design classes and projects. Uh, let's move next to uh, Andreas. Where do you see the, the future of uh, AR and digital twins going? Yeah, maybe we will explore it uh, in our university because uh, our motivation for the literature review was actually a uh, funded project that we are currently doing. Um, where it's about um, a digital energy twins. So the idea is to have a digital energy model of um, production line. Um, and one part of it is, is actually AR and, and VR. VR mostly for, for learning and AR for the visualization of the energy data. Um, and that's actually where, where the, the area and the, the work from, from George uh, would come into play somehow. I mean, not, not in VR, but uh, we are focusing on AR. So then when you walk around a robot, for example, and you can um, explore that data in, in 3D. So that's what we are going to focus um, in the next couple of months. And hopefully we come up with some useful interaction ideas. And yeah, let's have a look. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Yeah, I really do believe that the the combination of augmented or mixed reality and, and digital twins is a really powerful combination. But we are going to in in keeping with the theme of this workshop, we are going to have to solve the interaction design problem for problems that we haven't encountered before, right? Because the, you, you discussed visualization, for example, but I'm not sure that we know the best interaction techniques for controlling uh, digital twins. Uh, yeah. yeah, even with visualization, actually, there are still a lot of <laughs> open questions. Yeah, uh, as, especially as, as far as uh, yeah, as over overlapping and 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 contrast problems and everything like that that you can blend out or, or um, cut out in in VR or other other examples. But in AR, the real world is there, and it should actually be combined in in the best possible way and not distract from the data. Yes. Thank you very much. So next, uh, let's hear from uh, George, please. Okay, so, uh, well, I think the most immediate uh, next step for this work would be combining different forms of exploration, different uh, frames of reference inside the same application, because I talked a lot about this mode has this advantage, but this other mode has this other advantage at the same time. So do we have to choose one of them? Maybe we can combine them in the same application, but if we do combine them in the same application, are users really gonna switch between them all the time, depending on the task, or they are going to stick to one? So I think, and will this depend also on the kind of data and I don't know the available space, things like that. So I think the next step is figuring out how we can combine these different frames of reference inside the same application to leverage the benefits of each one. But also I talked about all the variables that could be changed. So we have to explore more about that too. So I remember that you, Rick, you, you first authored, I think, a paper on uh, research agendas for immersive analytics. And I think this, uh, sometimes it feels that we are just like scratching the surface of this area because everything, if we think more about it or if we change some details could lead to different things. So it's scary sometimes, but also like inspiring. Lots of future directions are possible. I completely agree. It is a little bit intimidating, but all we can do is uh, keep doing good work like the work we saw in today's session and uh, get there a little bit at a time. 
Uh, and finally, let's go over to Verena. I know you already said a few uh, future directions in the close of your presentation, but go yeah. Ahead. So as I already said, it would be awesome to like mix different kinds of application, like spreadsheets for making some graphs or tables and maybe image editing so that you can have the full experience to work in VR. Um, and also maybe the tablets could also be exchanged with just some surface that you might find in your environment. So you could just use a table maybe. So that would also be very interesting to look at. Yeah, that's a really great idea. And that could definitely leverage some of the, the earlier work in VR using sort of proxy surfaces or, or even redirected touching some or uh, also called haptic retargeting. So that would be Love Coley or Madi Asmandian respectively. And I'm happy to put those names in, in chat or in the Discord if you're interested in them. Uh, I think we are right on time for getting people to the next session. I know that we didn't get to everyone's questions, uh, but hopefully our authors will pop over to the Discord and be able to answer your specific questions uh, that you may have had about the paper. But I will wrap up here because I know there are other events starting right now. Thank you again to all of our speakers uh, who did, I think, an excellent job and presented some really interesting research. And thanks to everyone in the audience for your attention. Uh, I hope you have a good rest of your day or night and that you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See you. See you.